Onigashimasu. Welcome back to the Gojiru Karate Center. Yes, it's me. I haven't been on the channel for a while. It's good to see you again. Today we're working on a parent's guide to karate. So for anyone who's got children or teens involved in karate and you'd like to be more supportive of their karate journey and to try to understand some of the unwritten rules in the dojo. Sometimes as instructors, we're not so good at the communication side of things. So it's important to explain why we do things the way we do. It also kind of demystifies karate a little bit. And by improving the relationship between instructor and parents, we can better serve the kids that we are so honored to teach. So we're gonna go through a few things. One is uniform. Two, how you can better help your child get ready for grading. Three, how you can support your child's karate in the dojo. And four, uh, some karate etiquette and dojo etiquette in general. So let's get started. With regards to the uniform, you'll see a karate uniform is usually comprised of three major parts, the pants, the jacket, and the belt. I have got a much more detailed video on belt tying, which I'll link to in the description, but quick primer. The jacket should always have the badge on the outside, on the left, the maker's mark, which you can see here. Sheredo, we're still waiting for that sponsorship. Uh, the maker's mark should be on the outside, there should be ties on the inside of the gi. We just do shoelace ties because that way they're the easiest to get on and off. The belt, the end should be as even as possible. And there are two ways to tie the belt. So you as the parent are kneeling in front of your beloved child. This is how you're going to tie on their belt. You're going to take about a third of the belt, put it on the belly button, go around the back and then round again. And then you shift the belts until they're in the front and you've got two tails the same length. With practice, I promise this will become much faster. The, way I, the reason I've done this is that this way you get a nice neat straight stripe at the back instead of that cross over untidy look. Now, you're at this part of the belt. The top one, on the outside, goes underneath. It must touch the belly button and go over. This way, you, if you should be able to let go and the belt is already self-supporting. Don't ignore that back one and only go through the front. Then you get this untidy look. The other problem is someone can grab the belt and tighten and the person's out of breath. So we're back here one more time. The outside belt, so this one's underneath the belt, this one's on top, goes over, make sure you touch the belly button, and through. Simple knot now. Right over left, through, almost perfect. I pride myself on having exact length. So let's do the fancy knot, because I know you can do it. All the steps are the same up to this point. I'm gonna go through them one more time just in case. Take about a third of the way through the belt, place this on the belly button, leave the short tail, long tail goes around and around. And behind the belly button and through. Now you're back to having two tails. The top tail, the one that's come out of the belt, you're gonna make a little loop like a bunny ear and you're gonna leave it like that. The bottom one's gonna fly up. It's gonna go through the bunny ear. Here's the tricky part. And in between the belts. I'm gonna ask my assistant director, Junior, to bring the camera closer so you can see this knot in its detail. Right, so from here, this bottom tail travels through the ear, in between the belts, slide it through, you gently tug, and voila. Look at that, perfect ends, and you have fortune cookie knot. One, two, three. So why do we wear white, even though it is deeply unpractical for those of us with kids? It's because white is seen as a clean, hygienic color. It's easier to see blood immediately, and it tries to encourage a culture of uh, hygiene and self-presentation. 
I have done a much longer video on this as well. Suffice to say, if Shay and I had our way, the kids would be wearing the blue uh, judo geese because those things are bomb-proof and they age a lot better. Let's look at dojo culture. Why the bowing? So bowing is a much more hygienic alternative to handshakes. It's a great way to greet a whole lot of people at once without having to go shake individual hands. So you'll see we bow to our students and they bow back to us. It is not a religious thing. It's not a superiority thing. It's really just a sign of respect. You'll often see the height to which people bow indicates their respect for the person that they're bowing to. So if I bow to someone more senior than me, I will bow slightly lower. Um, someone more junior than me might bow slightly lower. But there are a lot of people who are technically my juniors in terms of belt, but who've been in karate longer than I am, who I have a lot of respect for. And to them, I will try to bow a little bit lower to show that I really respect the journey they're on. Sensei is the most commonly used title, and it literally translates to the one who was born or gone before. It doesn't mean most great high teacher, super turbo mega teacher, our most vaunted and high lord. It literally just means the one who has gone before. You, in, a, in Japan, school teachers are called sensei. An instructor of flower arranging is called sensei. Shay and I have this approach to the term that it only matters within the four walls of this dojo. Outside, we are Zoe and Shay. When we see our students in the shops, we don't expect them to call us sensei because the title is relevant only to the space and is one we have only earned within the space. It is pretty bad form to be using your karate title outside of a karate setting. In the dojo, the other titles you might hear are senpai kohai. So we often use the senpai kohai system to help um, scaffold new students called the Vygotsky method. So an older student or, a peer, or an older peer will help teach and sometimes they can help that student find understanding and mastery through what's called the zone of proximal development. So between us and the senpais, we help lift um, newer students and help them understand karate a little bit better. Interestingly, the term we don't often hear is dohai, which are your peers. So it's nice to train with your dohai as well. Okay, basic hygiene and etiquette in the dojo. Hair must be tied back. Um, Alice bands are fine, although preferably soft, um, uh, soft, what are these things called? Headbands. Headbands are fine as well, just to keep the hair out the eyes. I don't believe that we should be policing everyone's hair, like telling people they have to keep their hair short. It's not fair because people are only in the dojo 5 to 10% of their week and their identity is so much bigger than that. So as long as it's out the eyes and out the face, that's really all we're looking for, regardless of gender. Nails must be short. I know that this is hard for some of our students, but really you can't do a proper punch with long nails. And also it becomes a risk to other students. I remember I was training at my old varsity dojo and we were doing uh, groundwork and someone's fingernail cut open the skin behind someone's ear and it got nasty. So please, short nails are essential. We actually check it at gradings as well. Nail polish. Totally fine, it's got nothing to do with how you do karate and I love to see people expressing themselves with color. I myself love to wear um, gel nail polish because there's more to me than just being stern and boring old sensei. A very important point is removing jewelry in the dojo and especially rings. So if you have the stomach for it, I'm not gonna put it on here because I don't want this to get demonetized, but look up avulsion injuries. That's when something gets stuck under the skin and pulls it with. And ring avulsion injuries can be quite common in the dojo, especially when we're doing randori and groundwork. Earrings can be pulled, they can get um, caught in material when you do Chinese wrestling or randori. Chains, obviously, chains and necklaces must come off. Smartwatches have become the bane of my existence in the last five years. They weren't a thing, but now every kid's got a Fitbit. The problem is that it's a device that when we are doing any partner work, it's either going to get broken or it's going to hurt someone. So please, no smart devices in the dojo. I know it's very tempting to measure your steps. I'm pretty sure if I measured how much I walk up and down and around the dojo in four hours of teaching, I too would hit my step count but it's not a good example to set and it's not safe to train with. So there are a few things that you can help with at home if you want to help them get ready for their, their grading. Believe it or not, the technical details are not what we're looking for with white, yellow and green belts and orange belts. What we're really looking for is spirit and effort. We can train techniques. Of course, the basics must be there, 
but we are not as obsessed with the fine details you think what we're more um, concerned with is the general attitude and effort we see and by helping them at home you can help them build that confidence so a few things that you can fix one when they are doing their cutter make sure they are not looking at the ground uh, we often see this with shy kids and it's hard it's hard to teach them to look up and look people in the eye and to see people watching your cutter and it's such a vulnerable space. But the great thing about that is that it teaches them to get comfortable with performing in front of others, whether it's one day for a job interview or it's for a presentation, they're making a pitch for something they really love. Being able to put yourself out there is such an important skill. And we'll get to the benefits and pros and cons of grading in a little bit. So, obviously stopping them from looking at the ground or looking up or looking around. When they are doing their cutter or their basics, they are laser focused on what's in front of them. Always tell the kids, pinky, ring, middle, pointer, thumb. The thumb must be on the outside. Broken fist, I don't know what this is, asking for a lift? So from here, that thumb goes over the fingers and tightens the fist. With that alone, we can fix a whole lot of problems. You'd be amazed how most people are not born knowing how to make a fist, and that's why boxes, fractures are so common in fights. Four fingers in, thumb over. The other metaphor I use is the security guard is outside the house, not inside. So the thumb is protecting, and it must be outside the fist. Chamber hand, this again will differ from style to style, but for us, we like the chamber hand here, pulled back to the rib cage. No chicken wings. I don't want to see day. Someone pointed out in the comments. I don't want to see daylight between the elbow and the arm. This is structurally weak. So pulled back. And when they punch, they turn the fist and those two knuckles are there. I do have a basics video for beginners. So please refer to that for more detail on that. The next thing we'd like to cover quickly for parents is posture. Obviously with kids becoming more sedentary through Sometimes it's their fault, sometimes it's the fact that society we live in and we are so scared to let them go play outside or climb trees or that they just have such time poverty that they don't have enough time to go do um, additional sports. So please make sure when you see your child doing stances, especially shikodachi, we tend to quite often see this. The core is not strong enough so the body is weak while the body's leaning forward. So. We want to see that back straight, butt in, stomach in. Same in long stance. We don't want this kind of butt out thing, butt underneath, shoulders back, front knee bent. And just those few things alone are something that you can do at home with your kid and to help them feel ready for grading. Parents, that's all we really want you to check at home. Check their fists, check their chamber, their eyes and their posture. The rest you can leave up to us. Okay, speaking of gradings, what is with the color belts? Why do we have this system? Is it fair? So let's talk about it. The origins of grading were really to start introducing belts for when the Okinawans and the Japanese decided to send instructors overseas to start growing karate and creating a global following. Belts or ranks made it clear as in who was instructor and who was student. And we took the grading system from judo as well as the uh, geese as well. Why do we do gradings? Gradings are a great way to do small pressure tests two or three times a year, depending on the age of the student. It helps us as instructors see what we need to work on, what students need to work on. And like I said earlier, it helps with growing confidence. We had students who their first gradings, they were a complete mess. They couldn't get through the grading. There was much tears, much snot and throna, as we say in South Africa. And by grading three, four, and five, they become more confident and they want to show their skills and they want to demonstrate what they know. Is grading always fair? I think one of the hardest things for most people to realize is that karate is not always a meritocracy. So for example, my husband has been sitting on fifth dan for now 13 years this year because of things beyond his control. He just hasn't been given opportunities to grade. And he has watched people who started when he was a shodan grade past him. And no, in that sense, grading and karate is not always fair. Sometimes it's about who you know. Different federations have got different levels of what the, different levels of difficulty. Some federations just hand out black belts. There are people who are walking around with fourth dans who started after I did. I'm not petty about it. I just think it cheapens the whole standard. But when it comes to kids grading, <clears throat> I think what a lot of parents struggle with is when we try to treat students equitably instead of equally. 
We can't treat everyone the exact same because not everyone is the same. So what for one child <clears throat> is a very easy accomplishment, for another child it's a huge deal. So a kid that we might decide to give them the honor of a distinction on their grading, a parent might be like, but my child's karate was better. Yes, that child's karate may be better. Your child may also be talented and they're doing the bare minimum. Whereas this child may have overcome a severe learning disability, they may have physical disabilities. We might know, and the other parents don't know, and it's none of their business. <clears throat> we know that child's been through a very messy divorce at home. They've just been through a death, um, but they still come to the dojo. They still put in their entire effort, and that should be rewarded, and that should be acknowledged. Because if karate was only about being able-bodied and only looking for the next Miyagi or the next Bruce Lee, it wouldn't have the staying power it has now. I have no desire at all to find the next great tournament athlete. That's not my ministry. My ministry is to use karate to help people become their best selves, their strongest selves, their more confident selves. And that's so much more important than who is, can kick the highest or the fastest. Any chop can be taught to kick high. It's the dedicated effort that helps students find themselves over time and learning to get out of their own comfort zones and learning what they're capable of. That's what for me is, that for me is the benefit of grading, is helping kids get through that process and understanding that I wasn't doing my best then, I'm doing my best now. I'm seeing progress in my punches, I need to work on this cutter. It gives them something to work towards and helps them with goal setting. It helps them with learning to be confident and vulnerability and all those important things. So that's why we have gradings. Why do we have stripes and colors? So for our system, this doesn't apply to all systems, but for our system, the stripes are there to help slow students down who start young. We don't give black belts to anyone under the age of 15. We give a junior black belt to 15, 16 year olds, but nothing earlier than that. So what do you do when a child starts at five, which is the minimum age we start teaching karate? The stripes help give them something to work towards while slowing down their general progress, because if we gave a color belt every grading, then they would be on brown belt in three years, and they would have to sit on that brown belt until they turn 15. So for our five-year-olds, they have more belts and more stripes. And as people age into the system, our youth karate, so which is 12 and up, they have one less stripe per belt, and our adults go white, yellow, orange, green, one, two, three, white stripes, brown, one, two, three, white stripes, black. General tips and advice for parents. One, if you can afford it, having a second gi is not a bad idea, specifically for South African parents dealing with load shedding. It helps to have that extra gi in case the one doesn't dry. We've had a particularly gross wet summer here in Joburg, so I've had a kids coming to the dojo in their tracksuit pants, and please, it's better for your kid to be in the dojo in tracksuit pants than at home with their wet gi. Please send them to the dojo even if they're not dressed, because once in a while, it happens and we deserve grace. And one class in a, without a karate suit is not the end of your child's karate career. Two, if you are a hot mess parent, as I sometimes am, um, try automate as much as you can. Automate your dojo payments, stick calendars to the fridge. Our dojo calendar can be downloaded so that it will be automatically on your phone with reminders and notifications. If you are shuttling between households, um, we have many composite and blended families in our dojo. It helps to have that extra gi at one parent's house. And please make sure that you communicate to the sensei that this is happening because we want to extend the same grace to you as was extended to us. Well, part of the things I want to discuss, one of the tips I have for parents is have an open door communication with your instructor. It really helps us to know if something's been happening at school something's happening at home because a child might suddenly be acting out in the dojo and we attribute it to the wrong thing. Meanwhile, they're going through something at home. And sometimes that criticism in the dojo lands really hard and we don't know why. We don't know why this child who was previously fine with corrections is now having a meltdown in the bathroom. But when we find out, oh, mom and dad are getting divorced or a grandparent has just died if we know these things, we can take the pressure off until the child is able to withstand the pressure again. I had a history teacher, very beloved to me, and she said sometimes the wheels just fall off. And she would extend us extensions and grace, depending on what we were going through at the time. And I think a dojo should do the same thing. 
Personally, I'm trying to move away from the very militaristic dojos of the 80s, where everything was sensei's word is law, there's no room for failure, there's no room for mistakes, and that's not how humanity is. So parents, please talk to us. We're not going to tell the rest of the dojo, by the way, so-and-so's just found out. No, 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 we just want to be able to understand what your child is going through, or your teen is going through. And I know teens are strange, moody creatures, and when they're different in the dojo, I see them differently than you do. So please, if you are having issues at home, talk to us. We're here to listen. I have done a much longer podcast slash blog post on why kids quit. But I just want to say here briefly, parents, is that one of the things that causes kids to quit is inertia. So the longer they stay out the dojo, the harder it is for them to come back. You have to, if you want them to make it to black belt and to get all the accolades and the benefits of this belt, you have to actually just make sure their training is consistent. So I know it's hard to get them here 80% of the time, but that really is what it takes for them to, to see progress, to show growth, and to get where they're going. If you don't prioritize karate, they're not going to either. How can you best support your child's karate journey? Being supportive of their time in the dojo, not interfering when we are teaching, because what you do then is you undermine us, and if they don't respect us, this whole exercise is an exercise in futility. Making sure they train consistently, that they get to the dojo as much on time as possible. I know a lot of things are beyond our control, but we try to create a culture of punctuality, because punctuality is about respecting people's time. And it is taken so seriously there that someone was asked to do an apology because their speech started two minutes late. So obviously we can't be that hardcore, but I do think it's still something worth teaching and instilling in children. One of the hardest things to acknowledge is that karate is not for everyone. By its very nature, it's not for everyone. Just like violin and gymnastics and marathon running, anything that is hard will have a high attrition rate. So 95% of the kids that we tie belts on when we do our welcoming ceremony, we know 95% of them are gonna quit. They're not gonna make it to black belt for whatever reason. Immigration, illness, injury, moving away, boredom, because karate is not fun, fun, fun the whole time, and that's hard for some people. Hard is what makes it great. And if you want your child to become a black belt because you know of the benefits of black belt, the self-defense, the self-discipline, the ability to show up, the ability to be coached, the ability to lead, to sacrifice, to miss the birthday parties when everyone else is having fun. Someone pointed out in a great article how Karate Kid ruined the world, is that there's no reason that Daniel LaRusso should have beaten Johnny Lawrence. Because in real life, the kids that have been training every weekend and missing birthday parties, and those are the kids that win the tournament. Daniel LaRusso, with his six months of training, shouldn't have beaten the Cobra Kai kids who have been training for much longer. And as the parent, you will sometimes have to step in when it's hard. Like there are days when it's a beautiful summer's day, the kids are in the pool, and you're like, come, time to get out the pool and go to karate. And the last thing they want to do is go to karate. They literally don't have the prefrontal cortex to make these decisions. That's up to you as the parent. And eventually you will have to learn to tell what's the difference between laziness and genuinely hating the dojo. And there will come a time for many parents that you will have to understand that this, their journey has come to an end. They've gotten what they can from us, and we will thank them for their time in the dojo, and we will all go on our merry way, knowing that the door will always be open, they can always come back, and many of them do. I wish I had $5 for every time an adult's come in and said, oh, I wish I hadn't quit karate as a kid. I wish my parents had made me continue, because they would have been third or fourth or fifth dance by now. They quit because they hit a plateau or because of something else in their life that had nothing to do with karate, and now they have those regrets. So that's, yeah, parenting is hard because you have to decide when is it worth pushing and when is it worth letting go. I think I've walked on for long enough now. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please like and subscribe. We are also looking forward to our new merchandise shop, which will be opening in March online. I will drop the link in the description below. You can see the link and hopefully maybe buy some of our new shirts that are coming. Thank you again for your time and for your support. And I look forward to hearing from you in the comments. Arigato gozaimasu. Sayonara.